Why stop gardening because it's winter? Imagine being able to garden every day of the year, having the benefits of a sunny day without the risk of sunburn. Knowing what's going into your food from seed to harvest, you can at Green Thumb Gardening and Hydroponics. It's easy, educational, nutritious, and fun for the whole family. Let GTG Hydroponics show you how to garden in any space indoors or out with interactive living science projects for home or school. Visit Green Thumb Gardening in person at the corner of Route 15 and Park Street in Underhill, Vermont. Get hooked, hooked on, on Hydroponics today. today. We meet with climatologist Cliff Harris in his Jericho home, where he tells us of his predictions of our future climate. Climatologists are also meteorologists, but not all meteorologists are climatologists. Climatology takes a tremendous amount of work and a lot of research. But a climatologist is basically interested in long-range weather and whether it's going to be repeated or not, because everything runs in cycles. A meteorologist is he's just basically interested in whether it's going to rain tomorrow, or perhaps a few days down the road. Where I'm looking more in the long haul, the long scheme of things. Where are we headed? I kind of feel anybody look out the window and tell you it's going to rain, but maybe not six or ten months down the road. Mm -hmm. And cycles are actually pretty predictable. And we also look at other factors, like a climatologist will look at the sea surface temperatures, the solar activity, sunspot activity, volcanic activity, all sorts of lake levels, physiography, uh, all of these things uh, will be looked at. Uh, the uh, bathtub rings in the lakes, in other words, physiography. Uh, dendrochronology, study of tree rings, whatever. And I watch all of this stuff. And then if, if I have four or five climatological factors all heading in the same direction, then you can have maybe a 70 or 80 percent chance that you're going to see that happen. The science of climatology is still relatively new. I mean, it's most of what we've learned, we've learned in the past 20 to 25 years. We learned more in the past 20 to 25 years than we learned in the rest of the science and all the time put together. So the North Dakota Fair this year hired me to give my weather forecast and whatever. And what I do there is I take the prevailing trends and then I take the past records. For example, if on June 12th uh, in the last 100 years it's rained uh, 70 times, out of 100 years, well, you got about a 70% shot that you're going to at least get some showers on that day. That's just pure climatology. But you have to figure in what kind of patterns you're in. If it's a wetter than normal pattern, then you may have to raise that to maybe 80%, which you might want to pick another day. But if you're in a, a super dry, warm pattern, then maybe it'll be 50-50, and you can get Lloyd's of London to cover it for pretty inexpensively. My opinion is, and this is kind of my key phrase that I've been using for years, is that we're not in Mother Nature's greenhouse. We're not in the ice house. But I think we're in Mother Nature's fun house. We're not getting out anytime soon because we're in a period of extremes that's the worst in at least a thousand years. But, uh, it may be the worst in over 10,000 years. Since right at the end of the last great ice age, 
So again, uh, if that be the case, we're going to continue to see all these extremes where we have 500-year floods on top of 500-year floods, where we have all-time record cold followed by all-time record warm back and forth. And I believe that the that our weather swings from one side to the other, but it comes back to the same set point. For example, our temperature, a normal temperature is 98.6. Well, I think that the Earth has a normal temperature. And we may swing way to one side and way to the other, but we come back to that set point. Also, I took 600 cities around the world, some rural and some major metropolitan, what I call heat island type cities where the, their asphalt jungles, in other words, concrete and asphalt jungles, and of course there's been quite a bit of warming in these areas, no doubt about it. The last 60 years have been over a degree Fahrenheit warmer than the 60 years previous. But the rural areas, many rural areas, are actually cooling off, going against the global warming trend. But the problem is, is most of the people live in the cities or the suburban bedroom communities. They don't live out in the boonies of where there are very few people. But these areas are what we look at as far as a trend for the globe more than we do the asphalt jungles. Uh, another thing that I'm working and I'm just about done with it, but I can tell you this, that 40, uh, 482 of the cities, out of that 600, there's been really no change of any significance between the four, uh, 60 years between 1880 and 1940 and 1940 and the year 2000. Not enough change to even talk about. Two or three tenths of a degree, maybe four tenths. It's those other 118 cities. These cities are either, have either gone above a degree or they're below a degree, mostly above, and mostly these asphalt jungles. And these are the areas that we're watching because if some of those cities that, are, uh, that are, have been made a lot warmer by what man has been doing by cutting down the trees and putting in parking lots, in other words. Uh, this, if we see these areas becoming uh, cooler, despite all of what man is doing, then we're in a definite cooling trend. And if they kind of level off, which I kind of see now, and getting warmer, then maybe we've peaked. Now, the last time we peaked on this kind of global warming was before the Little Ice Age back a thousand years ago when Leif Erikson was the first man to discover America with his Vikings. Right out, and they were actually farming Greenland at that time. And they're not farming Greenland to any great degree now. Uh, so it was warmer then than it is now. But you have to go back maybe 11,500 years ago, 12,000 years ago, to have a period that was warmer than now over the entire planet. And that period was followed by the last great ice age. We do know that the cycle for great ice ages, for major ice ages, is about 11,500 years. And we're right there. So it could happen any time, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. But we're there. And I, as a climatologist, realize this. But sometime, in relative short order, we're going to see this global warming end, and we're going to come down off of that. And if it were me, I would be preparing for the other side. We should have prepared for global warming when the first signs were there 20 years ago that we were going into a warmer stage. But we don't prepare for anything until it hits us. And then we really, the accident's already happened. And like I said, I don't really believe that everything we're blaming on global warming has to do with global warming. I think the sprawl, the urban sprawl situation is a far worse problem where we're gobbling up all the, uh, the land. Pretty soon we'll be elbow to elbow and the, the land will be gone except for what we've set aside. This increases warmth as we've come in and built roads and you know, driveways and what have you and a lot of, they all absorb heat. Just like, uh, and they've moved the weather stations from the downtown areas in many cases, uh, mainly uh, backyards with trees, to tarmacs. And I believe really that man has done a great job in raping the planet and overusing resources and doing, not thinking before, the, you know, there, it's okay for growth. But just rampant growth with no planning causes problems everywhere. You're going to have problems no matter where you are. And I think we've made this warmer cycle worse. But a lot of the problems, uh, as far as temperature-wise, we're not 
I don't think we're affecting it, except in the asphalt jungles. Mm -hmm. We're becoming more urban all the time as we uh, run out of land. And where their bedroom communities are becoming cities now. And actually, uh, uh, Jericho is going to be listed in the almanacs now because it's over 5,000 population in this area here. So we'll be listed in here. So we are growing. We're not growing by leaps and bounds, and I thank God for that because that's why I moved here in the first place, was to get away from the hustle and bustle. But we are growing, and I think we have to watch for, for urban sprawl here. I think we, we could make the same mistakes they've made in Williston. Well, I've been at this for over 30 years of handling clients. Since 1971, I got my first client, a big client, it was Minute Maid Orange Juice. I had been doing work for farmers and writing columns for newspapers and radio and television and this sort of thing. I was a TV weatherman for quite a few years in Montana. And before that, I did TV work in, uh, in the Bay Area in California. And I was, I've been on national shows like the Rough House Show with, with Howard Ruff and others. So I have to learn about all the little intricacies of the climates of these areas. So by the time I'm done, I'm looking at, uh, at maybe 600 areas of the globe and watching them every day, and I'm writing every day for 2,000 clients, and I'm giving all these reports like I wrote about China and the drought they've had there, which has been a very serious drought in the Yellow River, the Yangtze River Basin, and so on. I wrote about that this year. I'm talking about the areas that just had the kind of frost you brushed off a windshield in Parana and Minas Gerais and Sao Paulo and Brazil didn't freeze the coffee, it wasn't cold enough, but there may be something colder coming, so I got to write about that. And then I talk about the soybean crop in Brazil and, and the wheat and whether the wheat's been hurt in Canada and what's been happening in Alberta against what's been happening in Manitoba and, uh, and points east where it's been too wet on one side, too dry on the other, and it's caused all sorts of problems. Are we going to have a shortage worldwide in wheat this year? Um, is that going to push wheat prices up there right now at 30-year lows? I think uh, we're going to continue to see this pattern back and forth where if you notice every other summer is warm lately and then the next summer is co cool and wet and then we're warm just like last year was cool and wet summer before that wells were going dry and we were hot not quite as hot as this June I don't believe but but again we were close but I mean these we just keep going back and forth we either have a winter with less snow than normal it seems like or more snow, snow than normal. Either the skiers can't ski or they they got plenty of snow. There's no medium ground and it's like this all over the planet. And so I would say right now that we're headed from this peak at, in a time of global warming. We can't deny we've had global warming. We have had it. I can prove it. But I think it's pretty well topped the cycle. We're coming to the end of it. Doesn't mean that we're going to suddenly just cool off overnight. We could, but I doubt it. But I think we're headed down the other side. Now, how far down? I don't know. But I do believe that we're going, that people in Vermont, if they want the old-fashioned winners, I think we started. This is number one. And we're going to have a few more down the road. Not everyone. Not every winner. But we're going to have more than our share. meet with Todd Hardy at his honey house in Heinsberg, where he shows us his bees and raw honey operation. The Champlain Valley of Vermont has traditionally been an excellent area for honey. We have bees from South Burlington down towards Virgins. The bee yards are spaced about every two miles apart. If they're closer than that, the commons gets overgrazed. There are too many bees. There have been many a, a day or two days in Vermont in recent years where the bees have made 50 pounds of honey in a, a two-day weekend. It's a marathon from the spring through the fall. It's a time-sensitive business, working with nature, getting the boxes on in the spring so the queen can move up into them and lay eggs to build a field force for six weeks later when the clover's in bloom. 
Honey that's raw will firm up or naturally crystallize by the end of October. So the perception arose that hmm, honey has to be liquid. It'd be good in December, January, so we can heat it and filter it. Filtering takes out all the good stuff, the pollen, the propolis, which is a natural antibiotic in honey. And these are the flecks that seed it to crystallize it and make it firm naturally. So if you filter these out and heat it, you keep it liquid longer. So essentially what you're getting in many supermarket shelves is dead honey that's been heated for hours at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. The bees gather the watery nectar, bring it home, pull the water out of it, and make a thicker product honey. Similar to maple syrup people, gathering sap, boiling the water out of it to make a thicker product maple syrup. They're totally the same. They pull it out with their wings, they fan. They go in front of the hive and they create a wind tunnel and it pulls the water up out of the nectar. Bees communicate with chemicals called pheromones and much more is known about insect pheromones than human pheromones. They're now actually putting pheromones in perfume for men or women to attract the opposite sex to get the others excited. Now bees communicate 100% with these pheromones, these chemicals in the air. The smoker blocks that chemical communication when it puts out smoke. So the bees can't gang up on you. It also makes them think their hive's on fire and they engorge a lot of honey and get lethargic. Just like you might after a big meal, like after a big Thanksgiving meal or something. And they're doing that to keep the honey away from the invader, me. But primarily it blocks their pheromone communication where they're going to gang up on the beekeeper and sting him or her. Bees go through different duties in their six week life in the summertime as a bee. One of the reasons they live six weeks in the summer is their wings wear out. They live six months in the winter when they're not working as hard. Pollen is their protein. And for three days she'll go out and gather pollen. She'll comb the stamen, the male part of the plant, and pack the pollen in BB-sized balls, tuck it under her wings and fly home with it, kick it off in a cell where they'll vacuum pack it and put a wax capping on it for use as food next winter when the flowers aren't coming in. Runners use pollen. Athletes use pollen. Instant energy. When I eat pollen and I'm hungry, you get a buzz. It's so good for you. It lifts you up. Marathon runners use pollen. That's a whole other part of the bee world. We, um, we don't collect it. Um, but we certainly appreciate it when the bees do and they need it to raise their kids to give them good protein. Good protein. Good protein. In 2000 and 1999, each of those years, we lost about 16 hives to bears. Just like the deer, the bears seem to be everywhere these days. Um, the raccoons come up to the hive at night, like the skunks do, and paw on them and eat the bees. The honey is brought off the truck and put into the hot room. There's air that's warmed, especially in the cooler times of the year, September, October. Last year we extracted into December. The honey has to be at room temperature and warmer for it to come out of the comb. So the honey is stored here and there's no heat in the air today that's added because it's warm enough outside. Here you can see about 40 pounds of honey. Here's the evidence of propolis I talked about earlier, the dark, hard stuff. It's a resin from the buds of poplar and pine trees. It's a natural antibiotic. 
This is what the bees coat their hive with. They're so clean. We helped Toms of Maine put it in their toothpaste 20 years ago. It sweetens, propolis sweetens your breath and helps cure gum disease, so it's good in toothpaste. This is about four pounds of honey. The honey is brought out. How you doing, Tisha? And it's put through the uncapper. The bees have capped the honey. This is not capped. This is honey, and this is honey with a wax capping on it. So the uncapper has flailing pieces of metal that are taking the wax capping off of each side. I'll get this. This is the wax that later goes into the wax melter to be purified. Let's put the frames into an extractor, which is a big centrifuge. Holds over a hundred frames and it spins at many hundred revolutions per minute. And the honey flies out and hits the walls and then comes down into the stainless steel piping system. It's very simple. This really hasn't changed in about 120 years. The wax, the pollen, the propolis go up over time. But 24 hours later, there's still a lot of it in the honey that hasn't settled out yet. And when we draw the honey off the bottom of the stainless steel tank, we are getting a light dose of it, which then in the jar settles up. So you get it at the store one, eight weeks later, and you've got the film of it on top that you see in part on the white cap. Mm -hmm. So we typically extract one day and bottle the next and there'll be an eighth of an inch or less on top. Mm -hmm. If it sits for two to seven days, there'll be less than that. Um, our customers have come, we have found, for the most part, to want a thin layer of wax and pollen and propolis on the top. The good stuff, as we call it, which makes it a medicine besides the medicinal value in the honey. So we found that by extracting one day and bottling the next, we can get that. Sure. Zero, heat. Zero heat. This is what we call raw. The US government allows honey to be called raw if it's lightly or heavily heated. And to me, that's like the country western song where the, the ladies sing to the guy, what part of no don't you understand? I mean, raw is raw. Yeah. How could you heat something and call so, it raw? So what is that? Is that how you say it? Yeah, apotherapy. That's from Eastern Europe. The word api, A-P-I, is part of the Latin word for honeybee. Apis, A-P-I-S, mellifera. Sweet gathering honeybee. In Eastern Europe, they have medical clinics devoted to treating people with raw honey. Pollen, propolis, bee venom. And it's all part of the healthful nature of our honey. Mm -hmm. So we just use that term from Eastern Europe for years, apotherapy, to designate it as truly raw medicinal honey. It's used in hospitals for burn victims. Mm -hmm. People every week write us or call us and say, I don't get allergies anymore because I'm using raw honey with a little flex of pollen in it one or two months before the season where they're allergies start. It's like having a dose of penicillin. You have the, what's causing the reaction in the dose and it builds up an immunity to it in a homeopathic way. So that's apotherapy. I think being in the field is probably the most challenging for these 16-hour days. We're doing something very unusual here in America in that we are the producers and the packers all the other beekeepers, for the most part, do one or the other. They produce the honey, they sell it in barrels to a packer who packs it. I realized that in order to do a good job with our raw honey, and as a small business in Vermont, we had to do both. So the real juggle is working with the bees in the field, extracting the honey, bottling it, and getting it to the marketplace. 
because they're different gears. We have a tractor trailer coming tomorrow to pick up honey that we're extracting today. With a short crop, we don't have an inventory of that honey already being bottled and ready to go to market. Well, I feel grateful to be at a place in my life where I work with God's creation so closely and trust that process. We see that all the more this year with the drought. We have about 15% crop and that's a, that's a real challenge for us where we depend upon a volume of honey to stock shelves from here through Manhattan to Northern Virginia and out through Pittsburgh to Chicago. And um, I'm not sure how we'll do that this year with a 15% crop. Our bees could build that 15% crop in the next three days with the heat that's projected for today, where the bees are, up to 35% in three days. We could be up to 85% crop in 10 days. It happens in the 11th hour. So um, I'm truly a man of the soil and um, I'm grateful to be doing this right now and grateful for all the people that help us out. It's a real community team effort and um, everyone that's involved in it helps make it happen and I love being part of that process and uh, a partner in that process and being so close to the creation. Why stop gardening because it's winter? Imagine being able to garden every day of the year, having the benefits of a sunny day without the risk of sunburn. Knowing what's going into your food from seed to harvest, you can at Green Thumb Gardening and Hydroponics. It's easy, educational, nutritious, and fun for the whole family. Let GTG Hydroponics show you how to garden in any space indoors or out with interactive living science projects for home or school. Visit Green Thumb Gardening in person at the corner of Route 15 and Park Street in Underhill, Vermont. Get hooked on, on Hydroponics today. today.